Uh, welcome everyone uh, to uh, Shifting Cosmologies More Than Human XR. Uh, this is the second event in the series. Um, my name is Benjamin Bacon. Uh, a lot of the students in here know me as Professor Bacon. Uh, but uh, uh, so I'm very uh, happy to be here and present to everyone uh, three very distinguished guests uh, who are going to be talking about uh, their views on uh, what shifting cosmologies and what more than human XR means. So uh, I'm just going to start off with a with the, uh, a little bit of paragraph here of, of kind of an original abstract we had uh, come up with uh, about shifting cosmologies. So this uh, event came originally from uh, XR research cluster uh, that myself, uh, Professor Shu. Uh, Professor Choi, Jung Choi at DKU, along with uh, 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 Boris and others from V2 and uh, various other artists uh, uh, have basically been meeting every about month to uh, six weeks talking about XR for about I don't know, a year and a half now, something of that sort. And so this is really uh, bubbling up and this topic is really bubbling up from those conversations. Uh, and um, we wanted to start to bring this into kind of more of the public view and have a public discourse about these these topics. So um, uh, here's the short little abstract that we originally wrote, uh, which is uh, Shifting Cosmologies More Than Human XR is a series of presentations and interviews that instigate a discursive conversation about XR technologies and their place in our default anthropocentric world. We consider how XR technology may be used as a theoretical framework and navigational toolkit to reimagine our shifting cosmologies from an anthropocentric reality to one encompassing ecocentrism realities beyond, beyond the human experience. We see this as a first step in generating a sustained co uh, conversations about non-human centric XR and the intersection with areas such as philosophy, critical theory, and creative pra practice in collaboration with the humanities, sciences, and technologies, um, and, te and technology. Um, so that was kind of the original abstract that we started with. Um, so, uh, but this particular event, event two, we are uh, focusing on a couple of other uh, uh, kind of more expansive questions within that area. So um, first off, I would like to uh, uh, just talk about who our partners are here. So it's V2 Lab uh, for the uh, Unstable Media in the Netherlands, along with uh, the Design Technology and Radical Media Lab here at Duke Quinchon University. Uh, and it, at the same time, it's intersecting with the realities and transition um, residencies going on at V2 right now. So, um, and over on the V2 side in the Netherlands right now, they are having a VR lunch, uh, which they've been doing uh, where they get together and they have lunch and they they talk. We get together and have pizza here at, at DKU and uh, we have these uh, uh, stream conversations. So, um, so really the objectives for this event is uh, we have kind of three objectives uh, set out for this particular event, which is one, the use of extended reality as a conceptual framework to shift away from traditional human-centric perspectives. Number two, use, uh, extend, use extended reality as a tool to reframe and critique reality. And number three, use extended reality as a mechanism for social dreaming and embodiment of different cosmologies. So let me uh, just introduce a little bit about the structure. Uh, the structure is going to be essentially our three guests will speak for approximately 15 minutes on their perspectives and their position on these questions. Uh, and uh, in part, they will talk about some of the work that they're working on and so on and some of their uh, uh, history, either as curators or artists or uh, media theorists and so on. Uh, that will be followed by basically a three-part panel uh, and an open Q&A with the audience. So um, I'm going to just go ahead and read off everybody's, uh, our three guests' uh, bios uh, before we begin, uh, but I'm going to do it in the order that they will come up and present, okay? So uh, Joe Wei, uh, 
who is over here who will come up if, if, she, if you'd like to come up so everybody knows who you are. Um, so Joe Wei is a curator and researcher and is also the founder of the Pan Bio Art Studio, uh, PBS. Um, and Wei is currently a researcher at Art Science and Technology, AST, in the Central Academy of Fine Arts, uh, CAFA, in Beijing. Uh, her recent research interests include AST in a post-human context, bio art, AI, and ecological art. In 2019, she was a, an international advisor for the European Commission's 2019 Starts Prize. Second up is Clarissa Ribeiro. <laughs> and Clarissa is a multimedia artist and researcher uh, with an interest in cross-scale information and communication dynamics that impact and shape macro-scale emergent phenomena. In her more recent projects, she explores the metaphysics of information visualization in subversive um, morphogenic Oops. that welcome uh, the uh, animistic uh, uh, to navigate uh, ecology uh, as cosmologies. Okay, uh, uh, she, she is an associate uh, professor at uh, the Technoatic Arts in Shanghai uh, and coordinates the Lab for Innovation and Prototyping at the University of Fortaleza in uh, Brazil. <laughs> uh, and last but not least, our third guest is uh, Mia Yu over here. Uh, and uh, Mia is a Beijing-based curator and researcher. She is the founder of the North uh, by uh, Anthropocene Collective, an art-based research project that explores the cosmologies in human uh, and more than human entanglements on the ecological um, bodies of Northeast Asia. Uh, Mia Yu currently serves on the jury and advisory committees uh, of the Hyundai Blue Prize and uh, uh, Porsche's uh, Young Artist Awards. Uh, she is also the longtime uh, contributor to the After All Exhibition Histories book series. And first up, we have Joe Wei. Yeah, I have a PPT. So uh, thanks for the invitation from uh, Ben and Vivian. And, uh, uh, since we have like 15 minutes, so I will focus on three uh, keywords. That is uh, techno, uh, dirty, bio art, and uh, uh, otherness. Uh, what, how to, by myself or? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, the, so the first word uh, is uh, techno uh, diversity, because uh, we, uh, today we have the topic more than human. So uh, people usually think uh, technology is universal everywhere. So like uh, genetic technology, it's the same in China and uh, in US and everywhere. But uh, we have this word techno uh, diversity. Uh, Just go ahead. Yeah, we can uh, have this book. Uh, the question con con uh, concerning technology in China that, that is uh, written by Yu Kui. And, uh, uh, he gives the definition, what is uh, techno diversity? So maybe I, I don't need to read it. You can just uh, see the paragraph. Uh, he mentioned that uh, if there is a diversity of people, it's not because of their color or race, but rather their different way of thinking. So, uh, uh, we have this techno diversity. It's a, a variety of ways of understanding and, and uh, uh, constructing technology in different cultures. Uh, I will use two examples to explain it. So the first is uh, 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 biomedicine. So uh, people may think biomedicine is like, you, you can imagine it's like a company producing like medicines, but uh, we have actually uh, like Western, uh, biomedicine, this image. And also, of course, we have Chinese medicine. That is, uh, it's, a, it's a very large area. So some people hate it and some people like it. It's very complicated. Uh, and 
in my perspective, I think it's like a hybrid thing. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's uh, like science combining cultural. So this is uh, I think the a uh, good example of uh, techno diversity. Another uh, word is uh, algorithm. I think people know it from AI, uh, artificial intelligence. It's quite popular in these days. And uh, people usually think it's a pure Western word, but actually it's from uh, uh, which country you think it, it might come from. Yeah, 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 exactly. So actually it's a, uh, uh, it, it was invented, uh, not invented, but it's uh, it's a, a, a Arabic word, uh, term, and it was uh, translated uh, from uh, Arab Arabic word to Latin, and then into English. Uh, I think it's from early 12th century. So actually, it's a it's a, a Arabic word, but now we use it as uh, quite often in in AI. So so this is a, a example of like uh, technology is not just from one culture, but it might be the relay race of different cultures. So uh, this is, uh, I think, the first part, techno diversity. So uh, it means we should have uh, more perspectives, uh, uh, not only in uh, rooted in one culture, but from different cultures, uh, from different parts of the world. So uh, the next part is my research area. It's bio art. So it's a, it's a, it's a word, uh, uh, I think it's hard to define. And uh, I have this uh, exhibition in uh, uh, 2019 and it's called Course in Nature. Actually it's a, it's a uh, how do you say exhibition? Uh, I put like different artists who deal with the topic of biology and art or uh, more broadly, uh, nature or uh, biotechnology, biomedia and art put together. But uh, we have one artist who define what a bio art is. Uh, that is uh, a one we have, uh, I'm now translating the book, uh, Eduardo Katz. Uh, Katz. He, he is an artist who uh, defines the term bio art. Uh, that is a, uh, uh, how he defined it, bio art manipulates, modifies, or creates life and the living processes. Uh, we should uh, notice it's a definition from an artist. It's not a, like, a, how to say, a very official definition from dictionary. Uh, it's like a, a manifesto in modern art, just a, a artist, a, how to say, a, one artist who gives a definition, but we can see some very strong words like manipulate, uh, modify, and create. And we can see that is quite, uh, how to say, uh, anthropocentrism word, because uh, the, uh, it, it's, it's always a human who it to other species. So uh, I think it's very interesting. And uh, it's definitely the definition uh, from because uh, he lives in the U.S. and uh, we have uh, more like uh, other sorts of uh, human and uh, uh, species from other countries. Like in China, we have this Xi Wu uh, called uh, equality of things from Zhuangzi, and also in Japan, uh, we have like a mono or some terms. It's uh, quite uh, they treat uh, objects and human and uh, uh, not only animal plants, but also like uh, uh, objects, they're equal to each other. I think it's, it's quite interesting uh, concepts. So here, uh, my 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 thoughts are uh, uh, there are different ways ways of to combine biology uh, with art. Not a, not only uh, not uh, the only way to is is to like human to uh, control other species. So uh, we we uh, I have this uh, how how to say the shift of uh, uh, notions from bio art to pen bio art because I noticed uh, bio art was booming uh, around the 90s and at the, at that time it was uh, most of the artists there from Europe and the uh, US because biotechnology was booming at that time there are not so many like uh, people for uh, artists from other countries doing it. And we can see very strong uh, 
reductionism uh, perspective, and uh, most of them are from uh, Christian Christianity. So it's 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 uh, also have very strong perspective of genesis. That they uh, the artists always create something or modify something, and uh, it's oh it's also quite tech uh, oriented. But here, uh, when we move into the new century. Uh, I noticed there are more uh, artists from different cultures participating. So we have like uh, East Asia and uh, yeah, different different uh, artists. And uh, uh, in this er uh, era, it's more like multi uh, multicultural based. And uh, uh, I think it's there's not so many uh, tech mania, but also more calm and with a uh, tech uh, neutral and tech critical like perspective. So this is a shift from bio art to pan bio art, uh, and uh, uh, there's a new uh, how to say uh, exhibition last year I curated in Shenzhen uh, called a new theory on on species. Uh, here I focus on the word on the term species because it's uh, I think it's quite a, a scientific term. Uh, from uh, Linian, it's a, a Swedish uh, scientist. So people usually consider species as a sci scientific word. But here I choose uh, uh, several artists that have different thoughts on species. Uh, one artist I choose is from uh, Hangzhou uh, called Tan Bing. And uh, he, he uh, yeah, we Chinese have this book called uh, Shanghai Jing, the classic of uh, mountains and seas. Uh, I don't know if, if yeah, you know, other uh, from other uh, countries know this book. I think it's worth reading. And uh, uh, actually, it's a book uh, introduced Asian China. Uh, there are different kind of creatures. Some are a hybrid of animal and human, and some are like a god. Like here, you have this god without head, called Xing Tian, and also uh, like several uh, strange animals live in the different places, different mountains and seas. Uh, we all know it's it's myths, it's a legend, legend, legendary things. It's not existed. But artists put uh he's he's very um you can see the the left side he put the x-ray technology with this with this uh how to say the the um uh legendary um creatures that never existed. So uh, uh, this is a creature with a, a bird head and a turtle part. Uh, of course, no, that is usually uh, means a real thing and they put it together to create some new sorts on the species. Um, this is a one uh, word, one example, um, and I, I will not introduce all the artists, but let's back to species, uh, this word, because um, uh, there are different uh, think, uh, thoughts on it. Uh, like uh, Aristotle, it's like a pyramid. They put a human on the top of the pyramid and then uh, animal, then plant, and then stone or something. And then uh, uh, we have the, uh, I mentioned the lenience, the, the Swedish uh, scientist, it's tree structure. And also now we have like uh, Ling Margulis, we have symbiosis that we are equal. And later even we have this, uh, uh, how to say, uh, synthetic biology. Then we have the artificial species. So it's like, uh, I think it's not just a scientific thing. It's just a fictional, um, uh, scientific and uh, philosophical, this all kind of sorts uh, combine, and then we have uh, we should have more perspective on the on the species. And this is also, uh, I think it's a it's a it's a way of people to see uh, ourselves. Uh, and the last part is a uh, uh, otherness because Ben uh, gave it to us. And uh, 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 that is, I think it's my own experience because in the in the pandemic uh, time, we we, uh, we all locked down 
and uh, we were uh, locked at home, but we can only travel like uh, within China, like for myself. Then I, uh, I, I was uh, thinking, uh, who am I and uh, what should I um, think? And, uh, um, and uh, what is different people, uh, how they uh, live in this world? So I just uh, walk out and uh, I try to talk to different people in China. And uh, uh, like I go to Qinghai and uh, uh, people there, uh, uh, they, uh, I find an interesting uh, concept. They they treat mountain as their friend or as a people. So they have, uh, they gave each mountain a name and a story. And then uh, they know each mountain quite well. So I think that is different way of uh, human and uh, um, how to say nature. This is uh, in Qinghai and in, in like Yunnan, I go to the, uh, how to searching mushroom <laughs> In the end of the world, and I go also go to the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and they have the uh, scientists um, do research on mushroom, and we talk a lot. Uh, that also opened my eyes. Uh, I also uh, went to find mushroom in the mountain, and then uh, Xinjiang. I also went to Xinjiang and uh, see the uh, grottoes. Uh, at uh, I think. Uh, in these places, I find the hybrid of cultures from Greek, from Persian, uh, from India, and from China uh, itself. So I strongly feel that cultures actually hybrid. It's not just one, uh, just grow up. So uh, this is my, my uh, I think uh, if you want to know more uh, about the otherness, you should, uh, you should know more also of yourself. Uh, this is a map. And the, the last sentence is, uh, I think the universe is a, is a, commu a communion of subjects, not a collection of uh, objects from uh, Thomas Berry. And I think that is the uh, uh, conclusion of the presentation. Yeah. Uh, and um, and thank you, Benjamin and Vivian, to welcome here. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, be here talking uh, together with Mia and Joe. Uh, big pleasure. Uh, as Benjamin told you, I'm from Brazil, but I'll be here in China for one year from February, I arrived and I was just landing on February 18th here and I stay until January 2024. Yeah, January, February. So Clarissa can call me CR. And I, I don't want to necessarily break the heart of the tech guys. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I, I see uh, you are attracted by the poster, and so they will be talking about the tech behind AR and VR. It's not exactly the case. Maybe you are navigating this idea of XR, but in a more critical way. And I'm not sure if you guys know, um, but now we're considering storing information in molecules. Yeah, and using bacteria as sensors. Oh my God, I will like not be playing with an Arduino and the sensors <laughs> familiar with will be using a bacteria <laughs> as a sensor. It's it's very cool because they're like ready to go. And I don't no need to like I don't need to have a factory the way you have, yeah, plants to produce bacteria. Yeah. So uh, I, I, as I said, I don't want to break you guys' heart. So I was doing some uh navigate, some navigating some information, uh, recent information or from before the pandemic about XR and our expectations. So I found something that was nowadays it's sort of funny yeah? from Forbes in August 2019, right before the pandemic. Yeah. And they were saying XR will be mainstream in 2022. That's it. 
And then this year, we have the Times of India, uh, the tech part of this newspaper, in March 2023. And they were saying, users have completely submerged in a digital world, thanks to VR technologies. With the ad of a headset, they are able to replace the real world with a digital one. I'm not sure <laughs> uh, which one is more impacting, uh, but um, I believe the pandemic was cool because we're sort of waking up. Guys, wake up. Yeah, do you really want to replace the real? Yeah, uh, but I don't believe so. Now I believe it will change it, like shifting, yeah? Shifting cosmologies, but shifting consciousness as well. So we want to get close to nature, I believe. You don't want to get rid of nature and just uh, like navigating digital fantasies anymore. Uh, maybe you need to, uh, it was health to have this moment to stop everything, yeah. And um, so I, I thought that sometimes when you think of the game industry or the mainstream uh, XR uh, tech, we just don't have something that Bertolt Brecht uh, used to call the uh, alienation effect, something that just reminds us, wake up, it's a play, <laughs> wake up, it's VR, wake up, it's a game. We are invited to buy the illusion and get immersed and, you know, get rid of reality. And this is not a healthy invitation, not anymore, yeah? So uh, I believe it's important to remind uh, that you have different uh, options when you're considering the idea of extension, what do you want to what do you want to extend? Yeah. Uh, and um, when uh, first the guys uh, invited me to come, uh, and this is about VR, AR, MR, but I remember Char Davis. I'm not sure if you guys know Charlotte Davis. Do you know this girl? No one knows Char Davis. Yeah. So I'm old. I was born in January 1st. <laughs> 1977, the year they were filming and producing and uh, Star Wars, first one, you know, <laughs> so I'm 46. And that, I, 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 I'm I familiar with Char Davis. And she was young back in the 80s. And she was together with the guys who started a company called Softimage. Softimage means something for you? Computer graphics? No, it's okay. I'm almost gone. But <laughs> that's it. Um, so... She was a girl back in the 80s. She was helping start like the main company. They were helping filming the Jurassic Park one, you know, <laughs> that's it. Uh, and oh, not filming, producing because of the, the computer graphics. But he, he, she had this very, very influential installation called Osmos. And was an illusion you were immersed in nature. But she did not like the term VR, virtual reality. She thought it could be more interesting if you considered naming it immersive virtual space, because it's a space. And when you think of reality, I think it's too strong, it's real, it's virtual. It comes from uh, Pierre Lévy, who was using Aristotle back in time, you know, so you're just virtual, 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 and the real and the real, it's just like an opposition. But why? Do, do you really need it? Can you rethink it? And, and she was considering the experience in this installation. So it was really something huge, you know. The, the VR thing someone had to wear was bigger than a projector, you know, like in the head of someone. And she was asking the, the, the audience to breathe and from breathing, controlling the interaction in this virtual space. And, and her idea is that we could, from this experience in this space, to get closer to nature, not to get rid of nature. But then we have a guy, I'm just printing this because maybe it's cool for you to 
go through some notes. We had Oliver Grau, and he had this book, From Illusion to Immersion, you know, not sure if you are familiar with, but he was writing about Charles Davis Osmos. And at one point, she, he was quoting her and saying, whoa, she's cool, yeah, she said this and this and that. But at one point, he, he's saying something like, um, um, Osmos, the, the, the VR installation, so like pioneering the field, confirms the opinion of those who see in the ideology of the natural interface a new level in the history of ideas and images of virtual reality, or who dismiss Osmos as virtual kitsch. The adherents of virtual reality, who really supports and like it, uh, who have often uh, reiterated their claim that immersion in virtual reality intensifies their relationship with nature, might ponder the following question. It's Oliver Grau uh, saying, why the immense technological effort, immense technological effort, in order to return after a gigantic detour to the real? Does not the quest for nature using techno technical means resemble the plane curve of a hyperbola pretending to be an ellipse? Why do you need to use tech? And so I'm back to Joe's talk. Uh, early time, uh, Eduardo Ducac, who is a Brazilian artist, uh, projects just too much tech to be back to nature. Yeah and too much of uh, Christianity or uh, no, not only, yeah. But um, not criticizing, he did a good job and he's still influential, but it's time to rethink and the pandemic well, was just giving us a hand. Yeah, and that's it. Um, and uh, I, I, I thought that maybe instead of calling uh, or reminding us in this panel about uh, XR, maybe you can talk about XN, like extended nature, because we're all uh, three here, me, Joe and me are talking about nature instead of uh, tech or the way we, we navigate this nature and tech. I have works in which I say, well, we can have a continuum between uh, wherever artificial and, uh, and natural uh, we, we do not have like, I don't think you do not have proper words. And before coming here, I, was, I had to fly from Brazil to China. Yeah? So I had a stop in New York City and I was chairing a panel there that I called by chance ecologists as cosmologists. So it's a somehow related. They are shifting cosmology disease related. And I had a friend from Canada. Her name is Amy Claire Hustis. If you want to Google, she has a cool website. Not this, like, it's, uh, it's it's cool. You can talk to her and get to know a little bit more about who, her work. She lives in Canada, in Vancouver. She teaches there. But we met back in time in Los Angeles, the time she was um, um, finishing her MFA at Design and Media Arts at UCLA. Um, but the work she's, um, she's involved in at the moment is a sort of, conversation with Canadian natives to learn the words, the words they use to name their landscape, the plants they have there, the fish they have there, the animals, even like landscape, the entire landscape. And she is learning that when you do not have proper words, we do not respect because you don't care. The words are meaningless. If it, I don't know the origin, maybe of algorithm and the word, it's a, I don't know the story. Yeah. When you use the numbers like one, two, three, like the way Western numbers, one, two, three, sometimes you don't know it's because of the angles. One, one angle, two, two angles, three, three angles. Yeah. Not triangle, three angles. So when you get to know the words, people who are living in a place for a long, long time, like people in Mongolia living there, uh, maybe you do respect more because it becomes meaningful, our relation to 
the world. And not only saying this, but when you know more about economy or um, your area, computer science, data science, yeah, lots of terms, yes, very specific, yeah, how can you use APIs or grab information from like the internet and run simulations or whatever, and it's better to know the words to, 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 to connect things, yeah, so um, as I said, in some works, I, I, I try to connect tech and uh, nature or uh, this uh, we call artificial in nature, but sometimes it's not that easy. And uh, Oliver Grau was just reminding me that maybe it's too much tech to talk about nature, yeah? And uh, you have to rethink it. And I found um, a very beautiful, um, comprehension, I think, from Philippe Descolam, that I think it's related to, to an extension of immersive spaces or an extension of reality. And he calls nature, nature itself, an optical illusion. And he's doing research about uh, Brazilian natives communities for a long time. And I believe this idea connects our talks uh, beautifully. Uh, and he uh, just uh, investigates the way natives in Brazil, they refer to nature in general as they are part of nature. So they never put themselves in the center. They call us ghosts, first of all, because we die. And the forests, the spirits of the forests, forest, they are the immortals. And we, like, especially in Western countries, we believe people who die, they are ghosts, yeah? They come back and they, woo, like they can cross walls, yeah? And they are the ghosts. But no, they, they, they inverted the logic. We die, so we are ghosts. The nature entities, they don't die. They are here forever. They are here before us. So they are like the mortals. And one beautiful thing that's influencing the like the Western world in media arts, especially bio, bio art, is that they do not center us um, as uh, something that has the right to kill, to change. They believe all our people. So we have just uh, fish people, uh, uh, Ant people, monkey people, they said we just have different shapes, forms, and different language. And back in time, uh, Charles Darwin, remember the guy? Theory of, theory of evolution, it's not Charles Davis, everybody knows Charles Darwin. And, <laughs> and so his professor, sorry that I don't remember his name right now, I can send you the research. A um, couple of months I was reading about it, but the guy was traveling from Europe to Brazil, to the Amazon, and he met a tribe, what they call tribe, but it's a community of natives called Tucano, same name of the bird with a B, yeah. And they were just helping him in exploring the forest and sharing this vision with him. And the time he was back to Europe, he was just going back with this huge collection of insects and plants and everything. And he wrote to Darby and said, oh, well, they had this vision here. They said, we are all the same thing. And please connect to the theory of evolution. And then you just gain different shapes. Yeah, and that's it. The theory of evolution is mainly about it. And he said, there is no way a God was creating this because it's too much complexity. You have no idea the huge number of insects you have here and huge, huge number of like different plants. We do not have this in Europe, but it's just like insane. Yeah. So th this, uh, this way, I, I believe you can just navigate all the way back and believe uh, or uh, consider that maybe you just need to learn how to extend nature, as I said, 
I prefer saying this instead of saying extending reality. And maybe you can just cooperate with bacteria using bacteria sensors, uh, with molecules and storing information instead of storing uh, information in uh, minerals. You can store information in pure molecules. Huge amount of information you can store in one molecule. Remember, it's one molecule, the DNA, that makes us the way we are. It's only one molecule, yeah? And I'm here and you are here. And the dinosaur is here and a whale is here and all the birds and all the trees. It's one molecule. It's too, too, too much information you can store in one molecule. Okay. And not sure if I have something to add. So I thought I have. Yeah. Uh, I ask you to, to, to share a paper, just like a A4 paper. Uh, I have a other copy here. I believe so. Yeah, this here. Yeah. So it's a sort of uh, the perspective I want to share, like first thing to say. Uh, maybe you can navigate across, cro like crossing scales, no navigate scales. And this is a way to extend our perspectives. Uh, this work uh, was presenting in the panel in New York in February. Uh, panel was at the CAA College Arts Association. It's more than 100, e uh, 100 years old association for artists or people who teach art. And the idea is, do you remember pole posters? They're everywhere, yeah? You go to the streets, China, Western countries, and you have this, oh, I'm selling a bike. Please scan the QR code and call me, yeah? But this is to navigate scales. And then uh, it's here, we bring your microbiome back. And fortunately, we have a guy from Brazil <laughs> in, in Sao Paulo or all over the country in Brazil. We have people say, we bring your loved one back. Just call me, I do some magic. Yeah, give me your ex-boyfriend's socks and I do some black magic. So I ha you have your love back. So it was everywhere on the streets. And I just thought it would be funny as a guerrilla, uh, you burn bio art something, not sure if it's bio art, but it's art for me. And then if you scan this and you follow the hashtag on Instagram, you see the microbiome of the tree, the bark of the tree. I had this pole poster or the tree poster on it, uh, just growing like, Simple experiment, 40, 48 hours growing in Petri dish. And then you sort of observe the colonies as if you're observing a map. And for me, it's a way to extend our perception or the way you can um, navigate different realities. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. So I think we've been doing almost exactly 20 minutes a, a, a speaker. So uh, Mia, go ahead and take 20 minutes to be fair, <laughs> instead of 15. Uh, but thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Hello. You got, you got one there? Okay. okay. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Ben and Vivian again for being such a wonderful host. Um, well, it's um, after having Zoom meetings for three years. It's really refreshing to to come here and face like um, real human beings and to breathe together with you in the same room. I think there's something that cannot be replaced. You know that human experience. Um, so when uh, Vivian invited me to talk about. Um, this topic, and I was thinking, oh, XR, I'm not a tech person. Um, I can't talk about virtual reality or that's not my field of research. And then I, I said to myself, why do I right away equate um, XR with that, you know, the goggle or that, you know, the, the, the helmet, right? So when you look at the images that um, Joe uh, presented, you know, the murals in the Buddhist grottoes, Buddhist caves, those are VR as well, right? Those are augmented reality. And those are the, the maps that are meant to guide people to the spiritual world. And prehistorical man, uh, the caves, that, that's the, that is the ultimate 
VR. So I, I think um, we have to, you know, really learn these concepts and unlearn them. Yeah. So today I'm here to to unlearn um, the concept of a modern human. <laughs> There's something I'm researching on. So. Um, uh, modern human, I'm sure you have read uh, lots of um, um, theoretical books and articles. I think it just to put it in simply as a critical perspective, as a post-anthropocentric perspective that prompts to think how the multiple species can co-dwell on Earth and to make us to, to redefine the, the definition of a human in relation to other species and to think about the ecologies and technologies of climate injustice and inequalities, right? So my engagement with these concepts are not through um, reading books only, but also um, through long travels and site research in a region called the Northeast China. You know, uh, Zhongguo Dongbei. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure you have the the map in your in your in your head right now. So um, yeah. So this is um, a kind of a region I'm uh, I'm from, and uh, which I ignored uh, for. Um, a long time. And I think it's during COVID, I decided to go back to that region to, to, to learn. Um, I, I, the, I, I was my, my trap, and I think it is through the encounters with, with the rocks, the plants, the soil, um, uh, the human, the landscape, and, and also uh, the ghost the ruins and the spirits in this region that I start to ground um, the, com the abstract concept of a modern human or Anthropocene in a very specific cultural um, social context. Um, and, and, and also this embodied experience in the field really um, make me rethink and sort of enrich these, um, uh, these ideas, which are mainly imported from the West, right? So my um, my trip uh, to Northeast China are uh, sort of followed on two uh, routes. So from uh, 2020, I started to travel along the railroad. Uh, if you have a map of uh, Northeast China, um, you know that it has this T-shaped there's a T-shaped uh, railroad from Manjoli to uh, Suifenhe, and in the middle it's Harbin, and this goes all the way to, to Dalian. So this is a, sort of the, the colonial railroads built by the Russians um, at early 20th century. And before that, this region was very much a um, sort of semi-protected uh, region because this is where the, um, the ancestors of the Qing dynasty, uh, the emperor's Qing dynasty came from. So it became a sort of a protected natural uh, reserve. And with the arrival of a colonial uh, railway and also the uh, imperialist uh, competition between Japan and Russia, this, this um, region has been um, uh, developed almost overnight and with the arrival of um, the railway and also other cutting up te industrial technologies. So um, according to some historians, it is the railroad that stitches different parts of this region as um, a kind of, or as a kind of whole, um, Manchuria, or we call it Bay. But the railroad also divides. It divides the eco bodies of forest, a body of the water. Um, and um, the, the anthropologists, ethnographers from Russia, from Japan, also arrived with the railway to study the indigenous people. And this is also when Manchurian tigers and many animals kind of start to be to on the path of extinction um, because of the arrival of industry. So this infrastructure of real, railroad is a hyper um, anthro, anthropocentric, if you say. And another um, route or network I travel along is the, is the um, Changbai Mountain Range, which uh, you know the Changbai Mountain. So is this uh, long mountains along China and North Korea border? Um, it uh, runs across uh, three provinces in northeast of China and the sort of go expands to, to Russia. It also a water tower in high altitude. Um, so there is a crater lake uh, called the Hemani Lake and the, the rivers such as um, um, Songhua River, Songhua Jiang, Tumen River and um, 
Songhua uh, Jiang, Tumen Jiang, uh, Yalu Jiang, uh, Yalu River, they all originated from this, um, this, this mountain range. So the, um, but ironically, uh, these rivers also later became the borders of the nation states. So um, China, North Korea, Russia, uh, all the borders are these rivers. So we are looking at a paradox, a paradox of the Anthropocene in Northeast Asia, that all these um, bodies of the water or forest, um, um, they kind of be, they become the dividing line of a nation state. Uh, and, and, and they were like, um, there are lots of conflicts, geopolit geopolitical conflicts. At the same time, they are interconnected, uh, um, you know, ecological bodies. So it is um, these, following this paradox, I start to research the so-called more than human figures, uh, which I call the ghosts of monsters. Um, so what are these uh, figures? I'm looking at um, all these plants and animals and spirits that transcends national boundaries that um, kind of mediates between the landscape, between the realm of water and land, and it goes between the realm of living and the dead. So, so maybe today I'll just present the three of them. And the first one is, um, I think I'll start from, from Jinsen. Do you all know what Jinsen is? Come on, Jinsen. Jinsen, Renshen, right? Maybe I, you guys know what uh, ginseng is? It's this plant. It's a plant with a humanoid shape. You know, it's a, the root that looks like human being. Right? And it's, um, uh, well, it's, it's a very important herb in Northeast Asia. So China, Japan, and Korea, they all, you know, highly respect this kind of plant. Um, it takes super long to grow. It takes at least uh, 40 years to grow just a little bit. Um, and it's uh, anthropo uh, anthropomorphic because the, look, the, the root looks like human being. Do you, you still don't know what I'm talking about? This is really an Easter Asian plant it looks like. I think everybody else knows, no? Yeah. So anyway, so Jinsen, um, let's talk about the cosmology of Jinsen. Yeah, so for... Um, it's a very much a part of the ancient Chinese cosmology when you talk about um, a shen, um, anyway, uh, how do I say this? Um, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the ancient Chinese imagine this spirit, this, this plant travels across the, cosmo wor the cosmic world, human world, and the plant's world. Um, when you, um, you know, this uh, this constellation called the Orion, this Orion, yeah. So in, in Chinese, we call this Shen, the constellation of Shen, Shen because that, that mirrors the plant, the, the stars and the plants mirror each other. Yeah. So this, this plant really travels and transforms. In the local mythology of Northeast China, there are many stories about how uh, Jinsen transforms into um, a chubby baby or a young woman and go to a uh, family and become a part of family member. So often this is to return a favor uh, and to, to, to send appreciation. Um, and also mm, when you go to look for a Jinsen in the forest, um, you have to, the, 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 the Jinsen hunters has to pretend they're kind of deer people. So they use a deer antler as a tool to attract Jinsen because the Jinsen really believes they are part of a, a friendship with a deer and, and a tiger. So the people um, who hunts has to pretend, uh, has to transform sort of as a, as a deer person. And this is quite common actually for hunters in the Siberia um, um, that uh, to, to, to hunt a deer, you have to become deer. You have to seduce deer. You have to seduce, really seduce a deer as a deer. Um, and the, however, when I uh, go visit the the Jinsen farms, 
um, it's um it's it's a it's a quite um uh it's quite a surprise that the ginseng uh now there's a huge ginseng plantations and the, uh, and the plantation also caused uh water soil e erosion in that region so i'm thinking and and ginseng now is a cash crop so it it really doesn't have this tonic power as a, as um as a as so bad as, uh, ginseng can have so i'm thinking like a ginseng uh, in the mythology, it comes to human world to return favor. Uh, but now it's Jinsen also going to uh, make a revenge uh, to human. Um, so this is um, 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 kind of imagination. And I'm collaborating with an artist called Liu Yuxia, who filmed extensively in the region of Northeast China in Changbaishan. And we're going to have an exhibition in Beijing in, in at the end of uh, June. So oh, you're all welcome. So the first figure is a ginseng, and the second one is a deer. And this is also in collaboration with an artist. If you think about Changbai Mountain, which goes you know, way up there, and it follows the China-Korea border, all the way enter the sea in a city called Dalian. You all know where Dalian is, right? And this is the very end of Dalian, uh, or the Changbai Mountain Range. And um, a friend of mine, Zhang Wenzhi, um, someone from Dalian, and, and he found that there are a lot of feral deer uh, in Dalian city, because um, um, the, there's a mountain in, in the Dalian center, a city center, and there are lots of deer just hanging around in the mountain. And sometimes they come to the sea, swim in the sea, and they come out and walk in the boulevard, walk in the human world. But oftentimes, because there's so much pollution in, and plastics in the sea, uh, when the, the deer emerge, um, there are um plastics are wrapped uh, wrapped in um in the deer antlers so there are imagine there are local uh, folklores of deer and um, whale they transform into one another uh um however i'm also thinking you know um deer has also become this monsters that um uh has a plastics wrapped around him and um um and he's uh, also lost uh, and looking for some sort of return. Yeah, so that's the deer. And the third figure is a ghost. And this might kind of relate to um, a VR experience. I have been researching a, a coal mine uh, in Fushun. Uh, this is the largest uh, open pit mine in Asia. So you have uh, almost a seven kilometer long and two kilometer wide and 400 meter deep. So it's a huge, huge mine. Um, it's uh, it's um, opened up, developed by Japan, uh, for occupied by Japan for 40 years. And then after 1949, this is the sort of the backbone of China, China's energy, um, oil refinery, and also all kinds of heavy industries. So uh, because of the mine is so big, Oh, the, the factories, the industries surrounding the mine, the earth shell collapsed. So because of the subsidence of the earth shell, all these factories have to be demolished. So I went there to film um, the open pit mine and the demolition of factories. Um, and it was just a just apocalyptic landscape um, with their fires everywhere, you know, there's the smoke and there's... Um, is really like um, is is like somebody just dropped um, a, a dropped um, a nuclear bomb, and in the industrial waste everywhere. And I was after a day of filming, I was trying to leave this area, but there was nobody. There's nobody living there, right? It's just ruins, ruins, and and waste dump. And then I there's this old lady came suddenly on her scooter. And I saw, I, I'm very surprised to see there's somebody here, but then I say, I ask her, where is the exit? How can I get out? Where's the exit, right? And she said, the exit is in the past. Um, now I, you know, look back, I think she might have said, uh, but I end up hearing, Right? It's a very sounds very similar, but I really like this misinterpretation of whatever. And I and it really strike me as a light lightning bolt. The exit is in the past. 
um, because this, this area has a, so much intertwined histories that have been suppressed and um, the colonial past, which you don't openly talk about, right? And, and this area has been sort of left behind, you know, uh, by places like Shenzhen, like, like Shanghai, right? Uh, and this is a, a huge scar um, we left on the planet of the Earth. Uh, so, um, so I asked her, um, where are you going? Do you live here? And she said, yes, I live here. So, but we are talking about industrial dump. And I said, can I follow you? And she said, of course. And uh, of course, I have a drone with me. And she said, bring your bird. And uh, I was like, wow, I'm onto something. So uh, she started to drive and I asked my driver to drive and I asked the cameraman to release my bird, the drone. And this is a, a quite an experience as I, so I have two perspectives. One perspective is I look at her in front of my car. The other is the drone view. So I'm looking at her top down and this drone, it doesn't strike me as um, technology or surveillance or power. It feels like a ghost. It feels like a ghost uh, slowly because we have to drive slow, right? To follow her scooter. And the drone was very low and very slow. We are following her and I'm looking at, I'm surrounded by a landscape. I'm looking at her and then I have another perspective. And this is like, it's like a video game or another multi-layer, the VR, you know, it's, it's just, and that moment I realized I'm leaving this reality, I'm entering another time and space, which is maybe another augmented reality, right? So I followed her and she led me to this home temple. Yeah, and in front of her home temple is this huge mine, right? And behind her is a demolition of the oil refinery. Yeah, so, and she has all these flags and Tibetan Buddhist flags around. There's um, altars of different kinds of deities and gods. And so, but all these figurines were found from industrial waste. And she was telling me about, um, she's showing me with a plastic frog and she said, this symbolizes water. And obviously it's a very torn down. It's, 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 she found it in the garbage, but she said, this is water. This is the water. Water symbolizes uh, flow and money, you know? And, and, she, and she started, she's a healer. So she started to look at me on my body. And she said, part of you is, the water is a stagnant. Part of you, is, part of body, the chi is a stagnant. And then I asked her how she, you know, how, sh sh what is the, um, you know, the, the, the reasons behind all the stagnation. And she started to tell me multiple storylines of colonialism, of migration, and how she father came to this region on foot from Shandong province and how she died. Um, and, and, and there was her, her grandfather also, also died under the Japanese rule. And then the, the, the mine collapsed. And then, but her storyline kind of has multiple temporalities. Um, and and that moment, I was I was really thinking I'm encountering ghost, you know. And this is this is a ghost that we should embrace. And this is the ghost that, that brings back just like those geological layers in the mind that it carries so many from the ember, you know, from ember that traps insects to coal that we extract for energy use to um, there are letters, uh, personal photographs I discovered on these industrial ruins. So, our, and they have a lingering presence that beg us to, to look back at the past and think about a possible future. So in this time space, I'm experiencing um, what you may call uh, XR. Thank you very much. Hello. All right. Thank you so much um, to all three speakers. Uh, really wonderful talks and, and food for thoughts. Um, due to time, we're just going to go roll right into the, the panel section and we're going to have some brief discussions uh, in a, a more um, 
uh, curated format, and then we'll open up Q&A to the audience. So um, uh, my name is Vivian Shu. I, um, some of you know me as Professor Shu. Um, but I think before jumping into the panel, I wanted to uh, give you a little bit of the, the question framework that we prompted to each speaker in preparation for this event uh, to give you a little bit of understanding um, how we are framing the panel section. Um, so we took um, some, um, so there is this book um, by Jaron Lanier uh, called The Dawn of the New Everything, Encounters with Reality and Virtual Reality. Um, it was published in 2017. And um, we took six uh, quotes from the book itself. The book is constructed almost like a semi-autobiography. Um, Jaron Lanier himself is a VR um, a pioneer. He both works in technology, but at the same time, he has a very philosophical perspective on the development of, um, especially at the forefront of, of VR and XR and things like that. And so there are a total of 52 definitions in his book that he runs through. Um, uh, but in fact, we chose three to frame this uh, panel discussion. And so these three are then uh, divided into three themes that we talk about this idea of interaction, relation, and world. So uh, the first is the individual. Um, the concept that we want to uh, ask the speakers to think about is this idea of embodied otherness and reframing of personhood. Um, the two quotes that we took from uh, uh, took are uh, two definitions of VR, a hint of the experience of life without all the limitations that have always defined personhood. And the other one is the medium that can put you in someone else's shoes, hopefully a path to increased empathy. Um, based on that, um, we developed, uh, we had three broad questions to think about um, and the idea of, of XR and how can we um, develop it further, both philosophically, technically, uh, how can we shift some of the trends that we see today? What are their limitations and what are some of their potentials? So the first question is, how might you def re define the otherness? The second is, how might you interpret immersion and embodiment in the context of otherness? And the third is, how might you consider immersion and embodiment as methods of shifting perceptions? Um, the second uh, theme that we wanted to talk about is to expand beyond the individual and increase in scale to the concept of the social. And in this, uh, we, we wanted to invite the speakers to consider uh, XR as a tool for social dreaming and a framework for social critique. Um, the two uh, the two quotes that we took um, as a, a different perspective of looking at what XR can be is hope for a medium uh, that could convey dreaming and the other is a shared waking state, intentional, communicative, collaborative dream. Uh, the questions that we pose, uh, therefore, are how might you define, uh, redefine the social? What could constitute participation in this defined social? How will, an ex uh, how will an extension and expansion of the social pivot our sense of cosmological place? And last but not least, uh, we wanted to expand the, the uh, concept of relationships and the social to uh, the larger concept of the world. Um, in this case, we asked the speakers to consider prototypical realities, world building between presentation and representation. And the quotes that we took are the science of comprehensive illusion as a, def uh, a definition of VR, and, and also a way to try out proposed changes in the real, real world before we commit them. Um, and with that, we had two questions. How would you define the relationship between presentation and re representation? What might world building between the real and the fantastical contribute to our understanding of reality? And with that, I invite the guest speakers to come to uh, the panel. So I, I just want to kick off the panel discussion. This is going to be more of a free form um, based on that framework that was set up. Uh, but I wanted to kick off the, the panel discussion with one question. Um, so I think, um, you know, VR and XR technologies are often uh, referred to as spatial computing in the area of uh, spatial computing. 
Um, and there was, uh, I think in all of your talks, uh, uh, in, in, and also your approaches to looking at uh, some of these anthropocentric, non-anthropocentric perspectives, um, you, you approached it from a very field research type of um, perspective, you know, going to actual places, uh, investigating uh, uh, the, the sort of local. Um, and I think what was really interesting in all three of your presentations was this presentation of the specificity of, and nuance of of, of realities based on the local versus a very um, two-dimensional, very um, flat, um, formulaic version of what reality could be. And so I wonder if you could um, talk about that understanding, uh, your understanding of reality based on um, conventions that are uh, brought about by experienced and lived um, uh, interactions with local environments and local realities. It's okay. Yeah. Well, um, as I, I as I as I said, maybe uh, um, I do not feel this comfortable to talk about reality. I think it's, um, because uh, it's always something that we build together. It's more like agreement. I agree that I see things this way, and you are you seeing the same things that I am seeing. So this is reality. But nowadays we have algorithms, yeah, and they're influencing us from like 24 seven, the images you get from our phones. So what about reality? I do not feel comfortable because um, we have companies and people who are, uh, we have some power, no matter the kind of power, they are shaping things that we can name realities. Uh, but I believe when you're talking about shifting something, uh, or we can talk about uh, nature or space or replace uh, those terms um, and try to find a different, uh, a di a, a different world. Um, but I, I, I believe it's important to get close to what happens or the instance. And for me, it's important to talk to people or to go to the places or get connected to out of the phone or maybe out of the computer or out of the online uh, to get the feeling of being alive in a planet that's complex. Yeah. And I, I remember um, science fiction, Chinese science fiction from the 80s. It's amazing. And it was never published. Uh, I believe it's China 2185, something like this, or 89. And the story goes more or less like this. Uh, more, more than 100 years from now, uh, China has a girl as a president. And they, the scientists or artists and scientists, like people like us here, they invented a scanner, a scanner that can scan brains. Do you know this story, the science fiction? So um, in the future, more than 100 years from now, 100... And I could come here and I scan... We have to do these scans, polycam in our phones. Yeah, it's cool. So it, you scan this bottle of water, but then you keep the molecule uh, structure and you get, well, like maybe you're not be that fresh when it's on my my phone, yeah, on virtual, uh, on the virtual world. And at some point they were uh, scanning milk, but they decided to scan dead people's brain. And they were scanning the brain of three old boys. One of the boys was Mao Zedong. Yeah. But he was just cool. He was doing nothing. But the other, the other two guys were just random guys on the streets, but dead. Uh, they were scanning their brains. And the brains the, in the virtual world, the internet, uh, they, was, they started working. And they started a revolution. And the revolution was going on for 800 years online. Time is passing in a different way. So it's about virtual reality. And the only way they could get rid of it, the Chinese, the girl was, that was the president in China, was turn off the power. So no light, no energy in China anymore. So this was the way. And they're talking about gerontocracy. When you have people, old, old people, 
who, who with like old vision as the guys from the 90s and uh, bio art they were nowadays <laughs> like uh, truly influential and keeping the discourse we have like tech and like arduinos and plants together and exploiting the animals in the labs yeah so this book is very very good very interesting it's very good quality science fiction and it's about virtual reality and the way uh, as I said, I was not comfortable talking about reality, but I believe that reality is not something that we experience here. It's not this. This is a space. Yeah, sometimes reality can be produced by scanned uh, dead people's brain. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, uh, earlier I, I asked a Ben, uh, what um, you guys, you know, what's the career path? And he said, uh, uh, some of you want to be uh, documentary filmmakers. Yeah. So when I started this um, travel journey to Northeast um, China, I also, you know, went with um, filmmakers and artists, and we did a lot of research um, by do Google, you know, about all these places, history, etc. But when we actually go to uh, the site, um, what all this knowledge kind of dissipated. And oftentimes we just left with a sense of a haunting, you know, and this haunting um, that you sensed something have been there and some, something are still around, but you don't have a language to, to unpack it or to define it. And there's a lingering sense that brings you know multiple temporalities as, as simultaneously past and present and future, and this is what really intrigued us. You know, we we stay in some hotels that built by the the Japanese, and then the artist next day will say, um, "Oh, um, so we did a lot of research about this uh, hotel, you know, historical research, but none of them matter anymore. All that matters is, oh, I dreamed of." this Japanese woman standing by my uh, bed, you know? And then, so when we go to these sites, we really experience multiple um, realities. And for us, we ask, especially documentary filmmakers, you know, what is, what is the real? And nowadays, many artists use documentary uh, footage, but also mix it with fiction and mix it with uh, using the strategy of a critical fabulation to bring out another layers of, of, of reality. So for us, like what I just mentioned, the, the story of encountering the ghost, um, there are um, multiple technologies we're using. We're using, um, you know, drone. Um, and we are also using the technology of storytelling, you know, because when we sit there with this woman, we told our story. She told us her stories multiple storylines, very disorienting. But this, this, this technology of storytelling also transport you to another time and space. So for me, um, especially when you research places like Northeast China, where there are lots of suppressed memories, um, reality is really a labyrinth. And it is up to artists to use different technologies uh, both high tech and also storytelling to bring out the multiple layers um, of haunting, you know, um, and to 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 present that reality is in fact a labyrinth more than something you can get from ChatGPT. Uh, yeah, I think this uh, this topic is kind of uh, philosophical. So, what is reality and? Uh, uh, from my experience uh, during the pandemic, I think uh, the word is always there. The, the thing changes yourself, your way, your ways of understanding and uh, seeing each other. I think after these three years, my 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 way of uh, seeing and uh, understanding the world is is uh, actually I I, I know uh, from my uh, bottom of my heart it changed and. Uh, uh, so I think a, a VR artist and uh, it's not different from painter or a photographer. They just choose their way. Uh, the 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 part of the world or or the uh, the reality they they think it works 
sing it and and present to you. So, uh, and uh, uh, and I think um, uh, and it re reminded me of the when when exhibition in UCCA uh, currently uh, by artist Gen uh, uh, he has already uh, uh, passed, but uh, uh, he left one sentence I think uh, fits this topic and he said uh, art is uh, just a medium through which I see the world uh, through which I see the world uh, through this medium you will see the world in more detail you will see a lot of different things this is how art helps me so I think uh, from this uh, perspective VR or any kind of art that they're the same yeah yeah um Oh, it also reminds me of um, uh, this uh, literary critic, uh, Sadia Hartman, and when she researched about transatlantic slave trade, and she went into the archives of uh, uh, black slaves, and often uh, the names are missing, and there are big, just big black holes of, um, you know, of all these um, women who went just completely anonymous. So, and she um, kind of resorts to the strategy of a crit critical fabulation, and she imagined the lives of these women uh, without a name. Uh, and history is really, and also future imagination is full of this kind of absence and, and, and holes. And I think as artists and also designers, and we should um, um, really bravely imagine and and critically fabulate. And this is, I think, how we can make the world. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. So I'm going to ask one more question, frame one more question, and then we're going to open up Q&A to the audience. So we, we discussed a little bit about this idea of reality and that complexity and that it is not really just uh, one dimensional or there's not just one version. There's actually quite nuanced based on embodied experience. Um, so pulling this back to extended reality, right? Extended reality focuses, enhances, um, and extends aspects of reality to construct new worlds. And so when thinking about this, um, you know, current trends in the technological development of XR really focus on this idea of high fidelity and immersion. But um, Maybe, but that in fact is largely based on, um, or right now dominantly based on computer graphics and then the with visual sense as the dominant sense. And in fact, um, I think when we put on goggles and it feels a little bit weird or, or things like that is because uh, the enhancement is maybe unnatural or uncomplex at this moment in time with technological support. And so I wonder if we were to think more about, you know, um, how might we reconsider the development of this technology um, in this context? What do we enhance? What do we extend um, of aspects of reality? What are your thoughts on that? Okay, it's a, it's a complex, but beautiful question. Um, I think you have uh, lots of um, different perspectives from art theory, um, on the importance of the viewer um, distance in relation to an artwork. Yeah. Uh, sometimes um, some, some guys will say there, uh, you need to do like a distance from something like maybe a painting or a sculpture or whatever it is, an artwork to make sense of it. So it's part of the experience the distancing and when you're talking about high fidelity vr yeah you do have high fidelity ar as well yeah you have like you're here and this is like the 3d place you have a tablet and you scan it and you feel you're inside different uh idea or understanding of immersion but high fidelity just some sometimes depending on the 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 the, the world uh just delete this distance and it's sort of dangerous because you're sort of deleting the self yeah i do not exist anymore i'm like i am the this world i am the high fidelity image because i do not perceive anymore my body i do not have a, a body anymore so um 
how do we place it in the art world? Uh, when you talk about art theories, it's not easy. You still need to write a lot about it. And it's a sort of dangerous experience for the self because it's, I don't think it's, we, we, do, we want to be deleted. <laughs> yeah. And we do want to fill our bodies. And I go back to Char Dave's. Uh, she she was just disappeared from the art world. She went to a farm somewhere, you know. Uh, but she was considering we can have the experience of virtual reality, no matter it's high fidelity or not. But we must keep the body. So we must remind us that we breathe. We have like a body, and this is the body that is experiencing. So more psychedelic, less psychedelic. Uh, more realistic, less realistic, and talking about presentation and representation. Yeah, when you think of representation, maybe you remember the Renaissance paintings like uh, Populet, and then you fake it, street, like the 3D faking, you have like the sky, not the ceiling. Yeah, so you're faking it as. Uh, it can replace, as the guy said, uh, this here, this space, uh, the, 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 the space we experience with the full body and all the senses. And polysensorial, uh, we, can, we can try to uh, rethink the sensorium to explore this kind of uh, worlds. But yeah, I do believe it's a sort of a dangerous relation when you think of art in high fidelity, replacing the experience experience of this kind of space. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, but well, when you were talking, I was thinking of um, a sh the shamanic experience I'm, I'm witnessing. Uh, up in the north, and often these shamans, they when what well, they are the mediums, um, um, they you know turn their body into an empty welcoming vessel and invite other spirits and animal spirits or ghosts to ancestral ghosts to inhabit and tell them information. But often these people will cover their eyes, so it's not to enter that stage is not through vision, but um, using drumming, sound is important, smell is important, and that bodily like kinetic energy of going into a trance and, and just you know let an eagle or bear to inhabit your body and you act like an eagle or bear or deer, you know, and that, that will help you to becoming other, becoming other, that's very important. And not learning about other, but really becoming them. Um, and so I'm very inspired by this. So um, I, I, I think the XR technology, it, it is there. It is going to develop anyway. So if it will engage other uh, corporeal capacities in the future and, and let us to really transform into not another human, but another, um, another species, you know, and that, that will be, that, that's kind of like a shifting our perspective, right? Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, I just want, yeah, what it, you, you talk is just I want to, uh, I think uh, it's about uh, what is uh, extended reality? Uh, what is this ex extended about? Uh, as uh, Vivian mentioned, the high uh, fidelity is, uh, is uh, how to say, the improvement of the industrial standard. No matter what happened, I think it will improve anyway, just like the computer storage. But uh, it's just, uh, uh, how to say, uh, industry standard. Because I, I uh, before I came to uh, Kunshan, I, I went to see the Beijing uh, Film Festival, the XR Park. Now all, all this kind of uh, film festival, ha they added a, a XR Park. And I I, uh, I watched all the, like, uh, this year is 14, uh, films. Most of them I feel so bored because it's still a film. I don't feel anything new and it's just uh, as I mentioned with a high fidelity and maybe a um, better machine but I don't see any new perspective. So I, I hope next time uh, the extended means more uh, perspective like the uh, not person but the how to say the uh, the like the the storytelling one is plant or 
yeah, or a, a rock or not non-human, that will make it, uh, I think that is really uh, extended me, uh, means. And also, um, uh, I think the artists in VR is not so, uh, there are not so many artists doing VR uh, so far, but I, uh, I, I can uh, figure out there are two pathways. One is uh, move to uh, film industrial, uh, and another is independent artist way. I, and I hope the later one can boom in with more uh, interesting perspective. And you, you guys can <laughs> do better with that. It's, it's not about a high fidelity. You can do like low fidelity, but with very uh, a fantastic imagination and that kind of things. Thank, uh, thank you to uh, our speakers for the panel. Uh, due to time, we also want to give the audience time to interact. And so um, speaking of the virtual, we're going to transition to two questions online. So um, the first question is uh, to everybody. Uh, what are your thoughts about different ways of listening to, ex uh, listening to extend reality beyond the visual domain? Uh, listening yeah, to the VR, listening to the VR. This is the precise thing, listening to the VR. Oh, okay, extended. Oh, beyond DJ. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, I believe it's important to remind that we listen to the whole body. Yeah, and I remember uh, 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 a colleague, uh, Kurt Stam. Um, you can find his website, Curtis Tam M M, and he was doing a research in Japan a few years ago, and he was interested in. Um, recording, uh, not sounds, but vibrations, and considering that uh, we have uh, myths in Japan saying that there was a fish that could predict the earthquake because the fish could feel the vibration before the earthquake was happening. And so he was discussing and uh, he was framing a few workshops from like this listening. And in one of his incursions, he was just uh, placing himself inside of the uh, huge bell. I, I think it's Bonsho, Bonsho bell. It's a huge bell. And there is a specific way to play the bell. It's not just tong. You can play like a gong, like tong, 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 like this bell. And he was uh, recording the bell and he was doing records, like field recordings. And he was inviting people to sound baths. So listen to the whole body, not like, you know, and playing with this vibrations. Like when you have a gong here, like a huge gong, it's just like, yeah, it's beyond uh, one, uh, it's a comp complexity of the sensorium. So I believe his work is a very good example of this extension of listening or the ability we had before the chaymans, they had, uh, we just, uh, industrial wage was just inviting us to forget everything. Like we don't have superpowers anymore, like from nature. They are just like workers. Yeah, we are not, yeah. You must be reminded of parapsychology and all this ability to feel things. Natives from North America, they could feel feel like horses coming from a distance. Yeah, we do have more silence on Earth, but well, it's important to uh, this kind of research Kurt Stein Tam is doing is, is, is just an amazing. That's it. Yeah, it's a uh, very well. It's it's a it's a good question, and I feel this is a direction I need to uh, do more research because the um, the size I'm in often the industrial size that has a really quite singular um, soundscape um, with so many heavy machineries, and the sound often has a body itself, and imagine that 
um, you know, the the machine is not just visibly there, but also has an extended sonic sonic body that vibrates and that contacts um, the earth and that pounds the the mind. Um, and uh, I I'm also um, collaborating with some researchers in Germany who does research on toxicity, uh, which is often invisible, but they are recording. Uh, well, I need to learn more about this and recording it so that uh, to make toxicity toxic more palpable. So it's a through the vibration um, and uh, using this uh, technique for transmediation to um, to have the the, the to toxicity um, uh, felt um, by us. So yeah, so it's uh, I totally agree that we should listen with our whole body and not just ears. But listen with our, um, yeah, whole body. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Again, I totally agree with Mia because uh, it reminds me uh, of last time I talked in a, a department in. Uh, 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 I was invited to talk in a, a school, and in a department called virtual image production. Uh, how to translate? 虚拟图像制作 Then I. I just think why they're only image because there are so many things and uh, so i think listen to is already a move on uh, to the the audio thing but we can move on more like uh as i mentioned the uh, full uh, full body like uh uh, uh olfactory and the touching sensing and uh, i think with the uh, uh, technology we can uh we of course we can do that because last time i checked the news i think google already uh uh purchased uh small of that to uh, this sorts you can just add this to your future uh, works yeah <laughs> it's just a, a different dimensions and as in the, it's it's a it's a feasible yeah it's not just imagination Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to stand up here. Well, kind of, kind of stuck in here by some chairs. But uh, so uh, I, we've got one more from uh, online, and then we're going to move to questions in the room. If anyone has questions, uh, but uh, this is uh, specifically for Clarissa. Uh, so you spoke a lot about extending nature rather than extending reality. What is your understanding of nature, and how is it different from reality? And is this idea of nature as separate from culture not exactly what's separating us as a species from other entities? That that's a tough one. <laughs> Let's give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> so it's my <laughs> it was my choice. Yeah, my choice, my trap. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, I believe I, I, I started um, talking about when there was this question about reality and virtual reality or blah, 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 reality. And I said, I don't want to talk about reality. I'll be talking about uh, space you build because reality, uh, it's an agreement. We are building conversations. Sometimes people were influencing us. And when I, I, I consider uh, uh, extending nature, it's understanding of nature, not only from uh, Western science, more conventional Eurocentric uh, uh, science, but uh, when you think of the way the uh, European or Eurocentric science was building visions uh, such as the evolution of species, they were feeding from notions as I said, from natives from South America and from all over the place. They were traveling to Australia, yeah? They were not there, like I'm here in Europe and I changed my mind, I'm a scientist. No, it's a conversation we have. And I, I believe uh, uh, when I say you are extending, I, I, I prefer to say for this panel to talk about extending, extending nature, is that... Uh, we do have to get rid of this uh, one, um, one, one vision of uh, 
Um, how can I say? What do we have outside of the body? Yeah, we do have papers and we have bottles. It's more objectified. And uh, it's an, an intention of getting, getting rid of this objectification, inviting to navigate different scales. And so when you, in the questions, invited to think of society, <laughs> better to include the microbes, <laughs> yeah. better to include the molecules, were made up of molecules. And the molecules are made of atoms. And the atoms, they have subatomic particles. Nowadays, you can scan an atom. You can see an atom, sort of see an atom. Yeah, we cannot. So you're still uh, uh, repeating visions from times in which we did not have microscopes. Why? Yeah. And so uh, can you imagine if you consider society as cross scale? could be more interesting. And if you consider extending uh, nature, means that you can collaborate. Remember I was talking about bacteria using their sensors or molecules storing information. So this is the way I believe you have the uh, uh, a way to extend something. It's not related to 3D worlds, it's too simplistic. Yeah, it's amazing, wow, it's beautiful, but I was, playing video games when I was five. And it was in Brazil, man, it's South America. It's not the center of the world. I was playing Atari. Yeah, I was five. And we are still talking about the same things. It's amazing, it's beautiful, but I believe we can collaborate with nature in, from different scales, even with atoms, because we have quantum biology, it's amazing, we learn like now we understand better the way you can uh, perceive uh, or can smell, yeah? It's not related to the molecules, it's related to the subatomic particles, the, the, the way they move. Then you smell one thing and you perceive another thing. So I believe nature and society, this understanding, they must be expanded through quantum, through like the molecular, and that's it because because of it i choose nature or x and n instead of xr that's it <laughs> thank you for the question <laughs> and I, i'm just gonna uh quantum tunneling oh yeah <laughs> tunneling. That's, that's that's the process of what's happening uh, but uh uh so why don't we just exp move that question on to the other panelists if they if they would like to respond to that also okay. uh... <laughs> Okay. Didn't prepare for that. Okay, no worries. Uh, is there any exclusive. questions in the audience? In the in the exclusive in the audience? Question. <laughs> there's an, uh there's a Jaden. Is that is that is that was that a uh, okay? Here we go, Jaden. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm I'm Thank you guys for being here, I guess. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I don't know, everyone always starts their questions like that. But um, I was, so um, a couple of you, I think, talked about sort of subconscious or like the feeling of hauntings or like uh, experiences that weren't totally visible or visual in like the real world and how um, sort of VR like digital spaces don't feel completely real yet. And I feel like maybe part of that is because of these subconscious experiences. Like people think places are haunted because they're subconsciously noticing vibrations in a structure. Um, what do you think can be um, added to digital spaces or virtual spaces to create or maybe enhance these subconscious um, experiences. Uh, not subconscious, uh, but uh, maybe imaginary experience to be uh, showed in a XR or VR. There's an uh, example. Uh, it's a, a gold Nika winner of Ars Electronica. Uh, I think it's uh, 2019. Uh, I think that. Uh, creator he uh the artist created a vr uh to show a, a patient of uh, depression how he uh, or she uh, experienced during this 
uh, syndrome um, happen. I think that might be one of the examples. Uh, you use some animation to, to describe the, um, how to say, the, the syndrome or what is she uh, saw virtually. I think that it was the, an, a, a good example. You can check the website. I think that's the winner of the 2019. We were speaking, there are some beeping, right? And and for me, that's like maybe another spirits from another realm are listening to our talks. Um, I hope they are impressed. Huh? Um, but for, well, sometimes when I am in the video games or, you know, but when the connection is not good, um, sometimes there are a, a lot of glitches. Uh, and for me, instead of showing an image of ghosts and you know, all those glitches or the, where the technology doesn't quite work, that's where the ghosts and spirits inhabit. You know? So I think we have to go beyond the idea of uh, yeah, depicting a ghost, you know? but it just, you know, we experience ghosts through vibrations, like, like you beautifully put. And, and and those vibrations and the glitches and those those uh, flashes of light, those are the moments that we feel not another world, a parallel kind of existing, and there are you know uh, spirits around us. So um, yeah, mm. yeah. I think uh, what I would say it's a sort of complementary, but life. Uh, well, we experience experience fail all the time yeah i try to go out and find the toilet but oh my god i got lost yeah <laughs> or and sometimes we go outside and there is a car crash unpredictability and chance we need more because everything till now it's so so predictable and this craziness about perfection and life is not this way so it's unreal <laughs> yeah does not look natural, looks artificial, because it's, it, 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 it tries to be like, the intention is that it's perfect, but we need more chaos, chance, uh, yeah, a layer. I think that's it. That could help us to enjoy it a little more, same way we enjoy it here, all together. Um, thank you for the uh, in-person question. We'll do one more in-person question. We'll move it back to an online question. So, Tian, do you want to? Uh, hi, I'm Tian, and thanks so much for the like very interesting and inspiring talk today. Uh, I have one more question. Um, maybe it's asking for suggestions from you as professional like re researchers, um, because I'm really inspired by. Uh, Mia's experience of entering a state that we can perceive um, the notion of XR without any technological intervention. And I think that's really interesting. And I'm thinking that maybe that is due to your like research methodology. I, I think it's more similar to like field studies. And so Maybe as a student, I want to ask for some suggestions about like how we can start such kind of uh, research or studies, mainly based on our embodied experiences, but not wholly like technological technology driven. And should we start from a theoretical framework or start from our intu intuitional experiences? I don't know. I think you should start by getting out of the campus. Um, can I, do, you, do I have time to elaborate? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the part reason we um, get on this journey, um, and also like Joe mentioned this, is because of COVID. You know, we, before we did a lots of international travels. So we went to New York, we went to Berlin, we see the latest shows, right? Um, but all of a sudden we couldn't travel. So we are, we, we, we capture, you know, <laughs> rediscover China. Um, but um, it's, uh, I started from my hometown. 
you know, I'm from Dongbei, you know, this really area that is everybody think is so, you know, declining, right? Um, but I have been like, as a, as a kid, when I was your age, I spent all my energy escaping, trying to get out of this place, right? I went abroad. Um, and uh, and uh, since I came back to China, I never wanted to go back. Even my parents live there, but I just, you know, um, Chinese New Year dinner, that, that's it. Uh, it's not cool, you know, some kid from Rust Belt, right? Um, however, I think that's really due to my ignorance uh, and my narrow-mindedness. Uh, I think this journey of uh, going to the field and research is a, it's a humbling experience. It taught me so much. So um, start with some, but something that you, you thought you were familiar with, but probably you have ignored a long time. And start with something that you potentially you have a deep emotional feeling, bonding with. And I, I think at the end of the day, why I keep going back is also because I deeply care about this, this place. Um, and also in the process, I learned to detach myself you know, to have a critical distance and not just turning this as some kind of nostalgic trip, you know, to no make a Dongbei great again. It was great, not, it's not great anymore. Let's make it great. It's not about that. It's about to go there and using your theoretical tools you learn here and go to the field and to adapt your tool, remake the tool. You don't serve your tool. You know, you, 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 you enrich that tool, you make that tool serve you, serve the real world. And, and, and I think, um, and, and deeply, um, and don't go there as somebody, you know, with a fancy degree, because you're going to learn a lot from the, the local people, from the, 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 the plants and animals. And so just, um, you know, being an open spirit, you know, being porous and open and learn and talk. Um, to people and make friends and be part of the community um, and don't really impose much of the theoretical frameworks and, and to see what you, but never forget what you learn. But the process is, un, is a critical unlearning process that eventually you will using that field knowledge to contribute uh, a field and to, to kind of um, um, to have this commonly share the questions that you can, you know, talk to other researchers, you know, and to generate the questions that can make other people from Brazil to think about their locality, you know, and this is, uh, I think, um, um, a small advice I can give. So we have a question from online and then I know Yuri you really wanted to ask a question. So we will let Yuri ask a question too. Uh, and that, that'll that be it for the questions tonight. So uh, I'm going to read the uh, question that's uh, from online and then we'll hand it over to Yuri after that. So uh, will it be possible? Oh, sorry. So this is the question. Will it be possible to live to, uh, uh, slash exist as a species complete in of XR or VR? So... I'm assuming what that means is basically as a species, could we completely live within an extended reality or, or a virtual reality? Do you understand like tech VR or uh, VR, AR, MR? Um, it depends on the, what kind of post-human you become. Yeah, we still don't know, but you started engineering uh, ourselves, yeah, we had engineered babies here in China, morning, uh, recently. So I don't know what uh, we can have for the future. Maybe we'll need it. Yeah, we we don't know what kind of war we'll be facing. Maybe we have war in the future. We have atomic bombs all over the place. We don't know. And uh, maybe you have to. We'll have this need. I I don't think we can. The organism can survive. If you're talking about dystopic, a dystopic future, uh, just like the body that needs to be alive in a sort of uh, place like the one you're describing, the the coal mines, the uh, the collapsed, uh, maybe you need. To be at all. 
if you want to live in other species life, uh, I think you can talk to the people who know this species best, usually like scientists or, uh, and I, uh, I remember uh, anthropologists also do that recently. Uh, the easiest way is to get some GoPro on an animal or some, some species uh, uh, body part, but that is, uh, I think, the, the, the easiest way. Uh, uh, you should know this uh, species deeper in, in uh, different layers, so it, it will spend more time, but it worth it, I think. Oh. All right, drum roll. The grand finale question of the night, Yuri. Oh no. <laughs> no, I this is a really loud mic. Um, I really, really like uh the topic of reality. Like I um it, it triggered me because as Professor Vivian knows, I'm really um interested in inclusion and um uh, accessibility. And the word reality to me was just very uncomfortable because if you think about it, what if someone have a vision deficiency? Um, in China, there's this word called mang ren mo xiang. It's like uh, different people with different vision deficiency. When they touch elephant, they would have different argument about what an elephant is. But you know, people with vision, we all have a social agreement about what elephant it is in reality. So I was just wondering, how would a VR look like if we also consider people with those vision deficiency, you know? Like, um, I, I'm pretty sure there would be some differences to like uh, the sensors, right? Like if we think about current VR industry, it's like mostly vision. We also talked about some, you know, feeling, uh, listening. But as we, as I think about the mang ren mo xiang thing, like it's the touch, I feel like, um, is what unites and invites people with these vision deficiency to to also understand how people with vision understands what reality is because according to the the exhibition that that um the exhibition of different elephants that people with the vision deficiency had they had like different types of elephant but in the end when we looked at the different kind of elephants that people made in the end it looked really similar to how people with vision looks like as an elephant so the, my point is I feel like touch is also a really important sensor for including people with such deficiency um and I'm just wondering how you know we, we did talk about the buzzing and stuff but um outside of that is there anything you would see that VR can do to include these people that have such limits <laughs> Mang Ren Mo is, uh, from my perspective, it's it's not limitation. It's just your your own thing. It belongs to you. I think that's a fantastic thing because you, if the world is a elephant, you you cannot fully understand it. Nobody can. So just get your part. I think that's and in your own way. Uh, if you're an artist, then in in your own artist way, that is, I th I think that's best. You don't need to touch all parts of the elephant, just um, get your part. Yeah. We were talking about um, technologies that can include, can be more inclusive. Uh, it's funny that we have this, oh, virtual and real. And real, <laughs> it's something that you experience with the eyes. Yeah, so this is sort of uh, not, 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 not okay. Yeah. And, and virtual, so we do experience, experience with eyes as well. So what's the difference? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, uh, I think it's an old um, way to describe this in, in the moment we, we, we did not have enough time to discuss. Yeah. But when you think of the tech or the mainstream tech related to VR, they are mainly, mainly, almost 100% focused on people with vision. Yeah. But we do have uh, lots of experiments 
uh, if you go to um, places uh, or uh, events such as SIGGRAPH and we have the experimental part, we do have lots and lots of experiments focusing on people with this sort of specificities, I, I, I may say. And so have like people, they cannot uh, walk like I'm walking here or vision. So we have like different kinds of sensors and globes to simulate, oh, I'm there in like in a, a 3D model of space, but I can touch. So I experience by touching and I build something that's three dimensional by touching. So we have lots and lots of, of, ex, lots of experiments in uh, universities. And uh, you, you're mentioning um, uh, Google just bought the, the, the company who was starting this. Uh, uh, it's like smell um, simulator sort of. You're entering uh, like a, a, a strawberry field and you have like the, the smell of the strawberries coming, you know. Uh, but then you're not entering the strawberry fields anymore, just like smelling. So if you cannot see, what's the point? It's just better to have a perfume, like, or smelling an, an actual uh, strawberry. Uh, it's complicated because the history of the field, if you go back in time, you go to Greece and Rome, you have this uh, depictions of uh, like gardens on walls, faking they were 3D and they can enter like as, as when you have mirrors, yeah, on walls. So it's mainly, focused on vision, but we do have experiments with different kinds of sensors touching or like playing with flexibility and even nanoscale uh, to perceive with the fingers. Um, it's, 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 it's very, very interesting, but not mainstream yet. Yeah, well, um, yeah, like uh, the we're talking about hierarchy of senses, right? And the Western, um, our history is mainly based on the the superiority of vision. You know, we'll talk about perspectives. But I remember uh, I saw um, this artwork at the, um, in one of the BNLs, maybe in Shanghai BNL. Um, it's a, um, the place with the idea of a cross sensorial modality that they have a people, um, I don't know, they're visually challenged or you know, uh, maybe they're just blindfolded and they play a manipulate or, or massage certain materials on the ground. You're a, you're, you know, everybody is invited to massage um, the, 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 the materials and then uh, the sensor connects to vision. So it translates that um, haptic movement uh, into kind of vision. And then people in the room will tell a story like based on what they see and tell the story. And then, you know, the, those people who are blindfolded will based on the story and to to mold the clay again. So this kind of uh, trans, um, yeah, sensorial kind of remediation. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a quite um, inspiring work. Yes, um I want to uh, suggest you to get to know the work of Professor Jill Scott from Switzerland. She, she was born in Australia, okay? Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Jill, Jill Scott, uh, she has beautiful works uh, playing with a sensorium and specifically focused on people who are blind or cannot see in you know, like a normal way. Very, very beautiful. Jill Scott, Jillian, Jill, Jillian, yeah, but, but it's Google, Jill Scott, Switzerland, Professor Jill Scott, yeah. She, she used, not sure if she's still doing, doing this at the moment, but she used to uh, organize laser talks there in Switzerland, at, at Switzerland, Zurich as dinners, it's cool. Yeah, I'm sure you're like, and you can write her, she's very, very kind and cute. Yeah, she'll love to talk to you for sure. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Clarissa, Mia, and Joe. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, evening of conversation. Uh, and um, I'm just going to make one announcement, uh, which is the next Shifting Cosmologies will be 
back in the Netherlands. Uh, but on May 4th, uh, it is roughly the same time. Um, obviously, we can't be there in person, uh, but we can virtually uh, extend our reality to watch uh, the conversation. So, um, but uh, other other than that, but I, I really would like to thank everyone. It's, it's really been a pleasure. Uh, and thank everyone who is online and thank everyone that is here. So, uh, okay. Good night. So again, for having us.